Happy Thanksgiving, Trojan family. Let's gather around the table. Let's eat. You are Locked On Trojans, your daily podcast on the USC Trojans, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, fight on, everyone. I'm your host, Mark Hulkin, and thank you for making Locked On USC your first listen every day, even on Thanksgiving. Whether you're watching the show on YouTube or wherever you're going to download the show, remember it's free, and I appreciate your support. If you are watching on YouTube, do me a favor. Become a subscriber. Help this community keep growing as fast as it is. It's quick. It's easy. It's free. Just click that red subscribe button. When you see the thumbs up, smash it, and don't forget to hit the bell notification. That way you won't miss one episode, Monday through Friday, as well as post-game reactions. If you were wondering what Coach Riley's intentions are, were, going forward, listen up. Coach and family, we're all sitting around the table, Thanksgiving, what we're grateful for, thankful for. Coach Riley said it in no uncertain terms. There was no ambiguity. Hell no, I'm coaching at USC, period. That's what Coach Riley said to uh, the Athletics. Antonio Morales on Wednesday, the day before Thanksgiving. That's how he answered the how he answered the question specifically. So if an NFL team calls and is like, we want you to coach Caleb Williams next year. Like I guess Coach Riley, he did a sit down uh, the day before Thanksgiving. He sat down with Antonio Morales, who writes for The Athletic. And they talked about a wide range of different topics. I'm not going to go over the entire interview for it, with it. You should probably subscribe. Check it out. It's a really good interview. Coach Riley's uh, goals and his aspirations, he continued with that answer. I didn't come here for some short-term thing. And as long as SC continues to give us the support and the things we need to continue to build this, this was not a two-year rebuild. No, I'm going to be the coach at SC. Period. End of discussion. I'm so committed to this place because I know what it can be. and. If that commitment continues to get matched around us, we're going to do what we're we're going to do what we've got to do in here and make the adjustments, make the tough decisions, push on the good, own the bad, fix the bad. We're in it through all the twists and turns, and I wanted to make sure people knew that. And the more people we have here with that same attitude, the faster the things are going to get back to normal. End quote. So, Trojan fans, family. Are you back on the uh, Lincoln Riley bandwagon? For those of you who might have been jumping off, or do you need to hear more? Do you need to see more? I I understand. I get it. Walk the walk now. No more talk the talk. I understand that. But that was a pretty straightforward answer. Didn't put to bed any questions about, is he considering leaving the program once Caleb is uh, drafted? If he changes his mind now, uh, there's just a four-letter word which you would be calling them. You know, it starts with an L. If you need another reason to uh, convince yourself that you should be watching Locked on USC, uh, because, look, you already know you're going to get the best insight. And, and in many cases, you're going to get the best foresight. So if you needed another reason, then you probably have to look no further than uh, the show I did on Monday. Yep. Is Lincoln Riley on the hot seat? That was the title. Is. It was a question, not a statement. On that show, I asked and I answered the question because I didn't have the opportunity to ask Lincoln Riley. Would you ever consider giving up play calling to take a more holistic approach to overseeing every aspect of the team? Those weren't my exact words. Um, That's how Antonio Morales uh, parsed the question to Coach Riley. What I said on Monday, uh, before he was actually interviewed, was that a defensive coordinator, you know, that hiring is imminent. Uh, And we can hope that it's going to be sooner rather than later. But the question I raised and answered and spoke about was Riley giving up the play calling duties and how it would be good for the program as well as, you know, help him grow as a head coach. I asked and answered my own question. I got some negative feedback. 
to that whole idea of, you know, Lincoln Riley. No, why, why would he do that? Although there were some who actually agreed. Here's how Coach Riley actually answered the direct question. Uh, just a couple days later, after I posted it out there. And I liked how he answered it. Check it out. There's nothing I wouldn't do. Uh, there's nothing I wouldn't do to do what's right for the program. I would never take anything off the table. So that's something I've thought about from time to time. That's also a piece of the puzzle in terms of who you hire, the other stuff, members that you have, where the program is at, at certain points. There's nothing I would say, well, I'm just not going to do that because I don't want to do that. Everything for me is like, what's going to make USC better? If I ever felt like there was, if I ever felt like it, if I ever felt like that was, I do it in a heartbeat. End quote. I'm sorry. Sometimes people really got to finish their train of thought when they're typing. That is a really tough sentence to finish. I apologize. So what he was saying, let me repeat that last part again. There's nothing I would say, well, I'm just not going to do that because I don't want to do that. Everything for me is like, what's going to make USC better? Question mark. If I ever felt like that was, I do it in a heartbeat. I liked that answer. In fact, I love that answer because it was the correct one. He agreed with what I said. It would be if it was better in the in the long run, where he can now trust somebody to do play calling and he could focus on the entire program, it's probably the right thing to do. But it was that qualifier that he said it at the end um, that kind of tells me that I'm not sure he would ever feel that way, where he said if he ever felt like that. I don't know if he would ever feel like that. So, but again, I'm not going to read too deep into that. Um, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt because he said he'd do it in a heartbeat. And especially if it would make USC better. And he said it also that he's here for the long term. He's not leaving once Caleb leaves. I know everybody's saying, well, what about Alex Grinch? Was he asked about that? In a roundabout way. Um, he was asked, is there anything you would take back, redo, or say differently from the past season? And the answer was, when it doesn't go your way, there's always regrets. There's pieces with the team that I clearly didn't handle good enough. I think the balance of the expectations versus how did we handle them, I did not do a good enough job with it. Uh, there was more to that answer, but uh, you should probably go check out the rest of the interview from Antonio in The Athletic. Really good interview. And it's worth it. Now, there was something, I, I do want to read this part of his answer. Um, sometimes you, when you play for big things, you can fall on your face. And we fell on our face the second half of the season. One, it was a climb up to get the team to believe that we could really win at the highest level. That didn't exist when we walked in the door two years ago. It exists now. One of the next steps is learning how to handle it and learning how to take that and use that in a positive way and not let it be a burden to you. I've got to do a much better job with that. My interpretation of that answer right there is it's kind of ironic. A head coach who is still learning how to win because he really he hasn't won anything, never won a playoff game. He's trying to teach a team that was nowhere close to winning big things how to win. So we'll, we'll see if the students are ready to learn from their teacher. Again, I, I want to emphasize, I thought it was a really good interview, really well-stated questions, and I thought the answers were just as well. Very uh, very forthcoming. I, I don't think there was a whole lot of coach speak involved, so go check it out. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On... <laughs> Locked on Sports Today has it is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts on Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube, subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. How soon 
do you think it's going to take? How long do you think it's going to take before these really good college football players start to use the college game as their pro career to get paid? And then bail on the NFL completely. Say, you know what? I got mine. I got paid. I played football. I don't need the NFL. Um, I'm thinking that they're going to start taking advantage of the situation. Here's how I see things continuing down the path if we if we go the same way with NIL. You got really good players coming out of high school. They're getting paid the day one. So now they're going to come into college, get paid, take advantage of their situation. I don't know if it's taking advantage, but now you use your your college career to get drafted. You're going to get bonus paid. You're going to get a contract. And then let's say, you know what? I made some money in college. I got a, I made some money for a couple of years here in the NFL. I'm healthy, mostly. I'm financially secure. I'm out. The reason why I'm bringing this up, former Trojan safety linebacker Dion Bailey, he tweeted out the other day, wish I was in college now. They're playing for 10 years, no real life responsibilities, and they're getting paid. It's the best jug out there, LMAO. But I think when he says the best jug, the best drink out there, I, I have to assume. Educate me, folks. What does that mean? What does the best jug out there mean? I can look it up, but you know where the comment section is. But I understand that COVID stretched things out for some players and injuries do as well. That whole perfect storm kind of came together for players like Cam Rising. Bo Nix is, I believe, going on his sixth year. <coughs> but to Dion Bailey's point, imagine a Caleb Williams type of talent, or maybe that, maybe that's too good. That's a generational talent. Slightly below a Caleb Williams. Getting that jug for two to four years in college, right? And then, you know, you're getting paid now, day one out of high school. If you're smart and you've got the right people around you, the right, the right support system, you're going to make that NIL loot work for you. And, you know, of course, you're going to graduate. I'm talking about smart players. They're looking forward to their future. They're planning ahead. You know, you graduate, you just, just on your name recognition alone, you're going to get hired. You're going to have a leg up because of that, even if you don't make it in the NFL. A lot of ex-NFL, NBA athletes, you know, they go into real estate, buy car dealerships, gas stations, restaurant franchises. You know, there's certain businesses that never go out of style. I mean, I don't get me wrong. I, I think 95% of the people, players, student athletes that I'm talking about right now, referring to, they're going to take that their NFL shot. But how motivated are you? How motivated will they be? How motivated do they have to be? I mean, think about it. They've been making money now in college for maybe four or five years. This is the new norm. I think, here's something, I mean, and again, once you dislocate an ankle, I mean, I've seen that before, or suffer another type of injury, you know, will that motivation still be there? You know, to compete at that level, to, to rehab, get back to where you need to be? Those are some pretty big, strong men playing a collision sport in the NFL. You're playing it in college too, but it's 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 a different animal when you get to the NFL. Not there's not too many college football teams where you got some six foot six, two hundred eighty five pound guy who can run four fives. That's freaky. That's what you have a lot of at the next level. Here's the main point, and I, uh, and why I think NIL needs some guardrails put in place and really soon. 
because this is the culture that instant gratification breeds. This is where we're at today. And it's only going to get worse. I mean, we're seeing it right now. We're seeing high school players who say, yeah, you know, that's my dream school, but I'm going there. We know why they're going there. And I also think it's why Dion Bailey said, um, after, he also made this comment, you know, after four years of playing college football, you, you shouldn't be eligible for any awards. Now, that might be a little draconian, too harsh. I mean, I get his point. You're, you're allowed, you're given five years to play four years of football, play four years in your sport. So I guess it's kind of splitting hairs if you do it in the fifth year. You know, let's say you get injured. Now you're a fifth year in college. Even though you've only played four years by rule, you're a year older than everybody else. So I don't know if I would if I would stick to that rule. But I think if you're in college for six or seven years, yeah, I might get behind that. I might get behind that. But I think it goes back to what I was talking about regarding sticking around and getting paid in college like a pro. Because now you've got these super conferences that are starting to take shape next season. The top programs, you know, they already they already understand in order to compete, you know, what was once dirty recruiting, you know, the, the SEC way, paying players under the table. That's all legal now. It's all front and center. So again, you're paying high school players to come to your school. And now you gotta you gotta maintain that roster. You got to keep that thing paid up. And I do mean paid up. It gets expensive. Right now, it costs anywhere from 10 to 20 million per season to have a competitive roster. And you and I and everybody knows prices don't go down. That number is only going to increase in the future. So I really hope the NFL doesn't mind their minor league system growing its own little survival system. Because I think there's going to become a point where you're going to start developing players that aren't going to want to go to the NFL or they're not going to want to play in the NFL for a very long time because they don't have to. In fact, I think it's just a matter of time before the NFL starts uh, maybe their own collectives for certain schools to kind of ensure they uh, entice players to want to play. I don't know. I'm just kind of spitballing, throwing things out there. It's Thanksgiving. Stuff we would talk about around the table. That's why I invited everybody to sit down. Let's talk turkey. I'm not talking just about Lincoln. We're talking Trojan football. We're talking college football in general. We're going to talk about what we're thankful for in the next segment. I know everyone's uh, been complaining about how the season ended, and I get it. No, I was a little disappointed. It's not what it's not how how I wanted the season to end. It's not over yet. There's still a bowl game, but I you understand where I'm going with this. But let's take some time to remember what we're thankful for. Really, right? You know, obviously, we're thankful for our health, our family, our friends, the Trojan family. The opportunity to watch them play again. We should also take the time to really remind ourselves to say thank you to that team that everybody cheers for and jeers when you don't like what you see. Remember to say thank you. I think it's important. Remember, they feel every loss much, much more than we feel it. We live through them vicariously. They're living it. Let's uh, let's say thank let's say thank you to Caleb Williams. He won the Heisman for USC last year. Their eighth. Reggie Bush was the seventh. I'm thankful that I know USC soon will put both of those banners up in the peristyle end of the end zone. Please, I'd be really thankful to see that sooner than later. 
I'm thankful because look, it's not often you get to watch seven Heisman Trophy winners in person in some in some capacity, either in the stadium or on TV. I'm really thankful for that. I'll be thankful when I get to see number nine. That's me knocking on wood that I get there. Uh, I'm thankful that USC is showing its the program, the university that is willing to do whatever is necessary to compete. The football only facilities. I don't know if they actually broke ground, but you've seen the uh, the fence, you've seen the uh, the banner going around it. Home of <laughs> set to open in 2026. So. You now have a timeline. I'm also really thankful, and this is not a reflection on the previous athletic director, but I'm thankful that there's a new uh, new athletic director that loves football, Jen Cohn, and I'm sure she'll make sure USC football, basketball, and all the other sports arrive. I mean, off to a pretty good start. I'm thankful that the uh, this was USC's last season in the Pac-12 conference. It's bittersweet. Don't get me wrong. I'm going to miss some of the uh, some of the banter, some of the rivalry, rivalries, some of those uh, schools that think they're rivals with USC. They're not. They're just having uh, some success at USC's expense. But look, there was more good than bad throughout the years with USC and their affiliation with the Pac-12, the Pac-10, the Pac-8. However, the leadership for the last 25 years or so, it's just, it's been terrible. That's why I'm thankful you, this is the final season for USC and their affiliation. It was time to move on. And I'm hoping that USC, seeing how they do it in the big conference, kind of changes the minds about how things are done currently, the old way. And I'm not necessarily talking about USC. I'm talking about the fan base as well. It's going to be a eye-opening experience starting next year. I really hope that re, uh, reinvigorates, re, rejuvenates the uh, the Trojan family, the fan base, gets them back out there for every game, win or lose, not just for a big game. Every game, and. I'm thankful for, well, this is person. I'm really thankful for the relationships um, I've made with the team, people associated with the team, the people I work with at Locked On USC, at WeRSC.com, my peers in the industry. I'm really thankful. I learned so much from the people who I work with. It's it's amazing, uh, and of course. It goes without mention, but I will mention it. I'm thankful for the opportunity to talk to you and with you uh, here on Locked on USC five days a week, sometimes more than that. This is a really humbling experience for me. and It's something I, I, I cannot express enough how lucky I am, honestly. Um, for me, this is a dream come true. So thank you for uh, for watching and listening and helping me grow. And again, let's let's keep growing this community together and get this community up to 10,000 subscribers and then 20,000 and then 100,000. Spread the word. Let's do this together, Trojan family. Sooner fans who are all over the show and others from all over the country. Thank you so very, very, very much. I hope everybody has a very happy Thanksgiving. I'll be back with another episode of Locked on USC because we do it five times a week. So until then, everyone, you know what to do.